Good morning to all. Welcome to HPC's worship service for Sunday, December the 6th, 2020. Today is the second Sunday in Advent, and we'll be hearing from the Coleman family in just a moment. I hope you watched the Clifford family last week. It was great. Now let's do some birthdays. Helen Martins is the 7th, and Bob Nist and Ann Scott have birthdays on the 11th. I have two prayer requests for this week. Pray for a speedy recovery for Charlie Klaus. He had eye surgery last week. It went fine, and he's home recuperating and following doctor's orders. And pray for Doug and Denise Fobel Lowther. Doug is now home and on hospice care. Pray for Doug and Denise. Now I have a thank you from my oldest daughter and niece. If we're keeping score, she's 11 minutes older than her sister. She writes, thank you so much for collecting plastic caps for Church Hill Elementary School. That's her school, Church Hill. Please keep them coming. And if you don't know, our school collects clean plastic caps and sends them to a company that melts them down into beautiful park benches for our school. It keeps these unrecyclable and potentially dangerous items out of our landfills and waterways and actually make something beautiful and useful out of them. It's a win-win situation. To date, we have two gorgeous benches and are looking forward to another one soon. Thank you again for all of your help. Keep collecting. Now, in the name of Jesus Christ, let's prepare our hearts and minds for worship as we watch and listen to the Coleman family speak about the second Sunday in Advent. Merry Christmas, Happy Advent Week 2 from the Coleman's. Week 2 is about faith. Uh, faith is a little hard for me because it's about waiting patiently, uh, waiting for something to happen that you don't see how it's going to happen. I like faithful because that's what you do while you're waiting in faith. Uh, one of the things, a Christmas tradition I will be faithful to this year is sitting in our dark room with just the Christmas tree lit uh, thinking about memories from past Christmases. Cora? I like making the candy cane cakes that we make each candy year. Candy cane cakes. Tina? I like seeing our family come out in Christmas pajamas. How do you see your new Christmas, Christmas pajamas? Christmas pajamas for the whole family every year. And Callie and Cameron are immersed in their gingerbread houses right now. But they also have favorite Christmas things. Like gingerbread houses right now. Joseph and Mary and the first Christmas probably had some obstacles to overcome. Number one, they had to put off their wedding because of the Messiah needed to be born. And that probably seemed like that wasn't the ideal way for the story to work for them. And I bet after their long journey, they wanted to be in the house with their family, celebrating rather than alone around the manger with the baby. And I wonder if Mary even questioned whether this was the miracle she had been promised at all, because they were in a, around a manger with the baby laying in straw. Uh, from one point of view, that could be a pretty depressing departure from what she had expected. But I think if I were there, I'd tell them that, you know, we sing about your faithfulness, these humble beginnings to the story of the Messiah. Uh, there's angels, there's the common shepherds, the lowly manger. It gives us a lot to think about and celebrate. Uh, I would also say that, you know, I know what your human feelings are, but if you're willing to sit and wait in your faith and listen, you might hear that there are angels singing right now. So this year, we're not in the sanctuary, we're at the Holman's house. And that's different than normal, maybe a little disappointing. But every Christmas is disappointing for some people uh, through illness or job loss, um, finances, military uh, excursions and deployments. Every Christmas is hard for somebody. The really weird part this year is it's hard for all of us. But the good news is God is faithful and that faithfulness is also for all of us. So. Even though we can't be together, we can still celebrate, be faithful and celebrate Christmas 
where it really mattered all along in each one of us. From the Coleman's, we wish you a Merry Christmas. Merry Christmas. Please stand with me as we are called into worship. The call to worship comes from O Come, O Come, Emmanuel. O Come, O Wisdom from on high, who ordered all things mightily, to show us the path of knowledge, show, and teach us in its ways to go. You may be seated. <clears throat> Let us draw near to God, confessing our sins to the one who is loving enough and powerful enough to take them away. Let us pray silently, confessing how we have failed to love God, our neighbor, and ourselves. And then together, using the prayer printed on your sheet, let us pray. prayer of confession. Merciful God, you sent your messengers to the prophets to preach repentance and prepare the way for our salvation. And yet we still do not listen. 
Give us grace to heed their warnings and forsake our sins, that we may greet with joy the coming of Christ, our Redeemer, who lives and reigns with you and the Holy Spirit, one God, now and forever. O come, O branch of Jesse's stem, unto your own and rescue them. From depths of hell your people save and give them victory or the grave. Amen. Please join us as we lift our hearts and voices in praise, singing hymn number 180. Gracious God, we do not live by bread alone, but by every word that comes from your mouth. 
Make us hungry for this heavenly food that it may nourish us today in the ways of eternal life. Through Jesus Christ, the bread of heaven. Amen. Scripture this morning comes from first chapter of Luke, verses 46 through 55. This is the song of Mary. And Mary said, My soul magnifies the Lord, and my spirit rejoices in God my Savior, for he has looked with favor on the lowliness of his servant. Surely, from now on, all generations will call me blessed, For the mighty one has done great things for me, and holy is his name. His mercy is for those who fear him from generation to generation. He has shown strength with his arm. He has scattered the proud and the thoughts of their hearts. He has brought down the powerful from their thrones and lifted up the lowly. He has filled the hungry with good things. And sent the rich away empty. He has helped his servant Israel in remembrance of his mercy according to the promises he made to our ancestors, to Abraham, and to his descendants forever. This is the word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. You know, sometimes... When I look around or I pick up a newspaper or I turn on the TV at night and watch the news, I've got to admit, I just, I shake my head and I ask, does anything, does anything ever change? Is there anything in this world really different from how it's always been? And I'll bet I'm not the only one who has ever had that thought. All our lives we've been told that the Savior of the world has come. And this is the time of year that we celebrate the advent of God's own Son, Jesus Christ, who came to bring peace and goodwill to all. And that 2,000 years ago. But has anything really changed? Is anything different? Well, I gave some thought to that this week, and I have to say, when it comes right down to it, my answer would be yes, yes, unequivocally yes. This is the second Sunday of Advent, and as I shared with you last week, we're doing it a little different this year. We're going to have a theme for each Advent service, and that theme is going to have a focus and, and then we're going to pick an Advent hymn or a Christmas carol that will tie the theme and the focus together and, and, and kind of join the whole service into, into one, one being that makes sense, we hope. And so this week, this week the theme is the long-awaited Messiah. The long-awaited Messiah. And our focus is going to be hope. Now I know that you know that last week, On the Advent wreath, the candle that we lit was the hope candle, okay? And I know that you know that this week is the faith candle, but as I said, I don't want this to be an either-or Advent. I want it to be a both-and celebration and and allow us to, to live into Advent in creative ways and celebrate it in creative ways. So just have a little faith in your hope, and we'll spread it all through the Christmas season. Now, in case you hadn't figured out yet, our hymn, our Advent hymn for this week is O Come, O Come, Emmanuel. That will show up in the liturgy. Um, You'll hear it musically. It will be the thread that runs through the whole service. Our scripture lesson this morning, our, our text for the sermon was also a hymn. It was Mary's hymn, Mary's song. It's traditionally known as the Magnificat. That name, it's Latin, and it comes from the opening lines of this 
Scripture when Mary says that her soul magnifies the Lord. And the whole song, every bit of this song, is all about the wonderful things, the amazing things the coming of the Messiah has accomplished. So what difference? What difference did Jesus coming into the world really make? I mean, you look around, people sure do seem to act the same way that they always have from the Old Testament on. What did the Messiah bring that wasn't here already? That's the question for this morning. And in a word, just this, freedom. The Messiah, Jesus Christ, coming into the world brought freedom. Jesus brought freedom true freedom into the world. And as true as this is, we still struggle to understand it. We still struggle to see the results of that freedom, the changes that it has made. Even we Christians have a hard time wrapping our minds around this freedom that Jesus introduced into the world. So I thought maybe Maybe it would help if I talked a little bit about the way the world operated before Jesus came into it. And to be quite honest, the way the world still operates outside of Christianity. And unfortunately, even within Christianity sometimes. So, give you an idea. My dad used to say that 3% of the people will do wrong no matter what. No matter what, 3% will do wrong. 2% of the people will do right, no matter what, regardless of the circumstances. 95% of people will do right if you make them. Now, I don't know what you all think about those statistics, but my observations over the last 50 years or so tell me that he was not far off the mark with that observation. Regardless, I think we can agree that most people, most people, ourselves included sometimes, will do right if you make them. In other words, the world operates on a reward and punishment basis. That old carrot and the stick concept drives the world for the most part. And I believe you'll also agree, if you take just a little bit of time to think about it, I think you'll agree that most societies, certainly most governments around the world operate on this principle and most religions operate on this reward and punishment, carrot and the stick principle, except for Christianity, except Christianity. The coming of Christ into the world has freed us from being solely motivated by reward and punishment. Through Jesus, we have been given for the first time since the fall of Adam and Eve, we have been given the freedom to love. That is the freedom that Jesus has brought. Now Mary's song, the Magnificat, offers three examples of how this freedom has come into the world. And the first one comes from her statement, he has scattered the proud in the thoughts of their hearts. You know, our pride, our pride that comes from our own accomplishments, when we realize in the deepest depths of our heart that nothing, absolutely nothing that we can do will ever earn the reward of eternal life, that pride is just scattered. When we realize that there's nothing that we can do that will save us from eternal damnation, our pride is just scattered. Christianity is the only religion that offers the ultimate reward, eternal life, through the grace of Jesus Christ not our own actions. We cannot earn our way into heaven and we cannot save ourselves from hell. So we are free. We are free to love God and each other without a single thought of how we might be rewarded for doing that 
or how we might be punished for not doing that. We have the freedom now to simply love. Next example out of the scripture, out of the Magnificat, is freedom within a social context. Might not have expected that one, but she says, he has brought down the powerful from their thrones and lifted up the lowly. If the ultimate reward in life is gained through Christ, not by us, but by Christ, and we are saved from the ultimate punishment also by Christ, then what possible significance can social hierarchy have? It's already said and done. God doesn't care more about kings than he does beggars, and we shouldn't either. And kings shouldn't think themselves better, nor beggars worse. We are all in Christ. Now, this is no, this is no great social leveling mandated by the state and enforced by the police. It's absolutely not. It is a voluntary shift in worldview. It's the absolute inevitable result of realizing who we are in Christ. It's the freedom that comes from the real understanding of how we relate to God and consequently each other. We are no longer defined by the roles that we play in this world, by the lot that we, was, that we were given, by the cards that we were dealt in life. That does not define who we are because we are all part of the same family and we are all one in Christ. Finally, Mary sings, he has filled the hungry with good things and sent the rich away empty. You see, if we're free from social hierarchies, if they don't really have any impact, if they don't really have any depth in this Christian system, if we're free from social hierarchies, then we're also free from economic disparities. You know, the early Christian community, if you read in the book of Acts, you'll see that they, they shared their money and possessions with one another. And they did this. They did this out of love, not because they thought they would get a reward for doing it, not because they wanted to avoid punishment by not doing it, and it was certainly not because of some philosophy extolling the benefits of wealth redistribution was love that drove them. It was absolute love for those that they saw in need within their community. That's all. Simple, pure love. I cannot stress this enough. The uniqueness, the absolute uniqueness of Christianity's freedom from the pressures of reward and punishment is absolutely amazing. It's remarkable, and it's almost never recognized. We almost never see it. Even Jesus' disciples did not pick up on it when he was with them. They still thought that he was going to bring in some kind of magnificent world power government and establish it, and it would be backed by an army, a military that could not be defeated. They saw it all in worldly terms. And all in reward and punishment terms. Even they didn't understand how absolutely unique this new kingdom of relational community was in the world. And the world still doesn't understand it because we Christians really struggle to live into it. All of the freedom that Jesus offers, we just, we struggle to wrap our minds around it and live like it's real. Because we're just people, after all. And we tend to think always in terms of the carrot and the stick. That's just how our minds work. Even in our practice of Christianity. You know, we think if we're nice, we'll get into heaven. If we're not nice, we're going to go to hell. We know better. We, in our minds, we know better. 
But it's so foundational to the way that we look at the world that it's really, really hard to make that shift and to change it when we live into our Christian faith. But here's something. Here's something that might help just a little bit. One thing to keep in mind is that a reward and punishment system, that is always about yourself. It's always about yourself. Am I going to get the reward? Am I going to be punished? Christianity, the freedom to love that Christianity offers outside of that reward and punishment system is always about someone else. Always focuses on the other. So if we're trying to figure out if we're living into the freedom that Christ offers, if we're trying to see if we're following that, we can just ask ourselves, is this about me or is this about others? Is this about me getting a reward or, or avoiding a punishment? Or is it about what is best for someone else? That is the litmus test for whether or not we're following Jesus Christ. Now, some of you may be sitting there thinking, well, you know, I see what you're saying, but Christianity still seems like a real carrot and stick religion. I mean, you just got to go to Scripture. And it's all about rewards and punishments, isn't it? I mean, think of the sheep and the goats that we talked about in Matthew 25 just a couple of weeks ago. Didn't the good sheep get into the kingdom of heaven? And the bad goats, they were sent to the eternal fires of punishment? Sounds like carrots and sticks to me. Unless, unless there's another way to think about those comparisons. Maybe there is. Maybe, maybe the right and wrong of Christianity, the rules of our faith, the commandments of Jesus even, are not so much about how to find rewards and avoid punishment as we might think. And, and this, is, this is the hardest thing for us to understand. It's the hardest thing to remember about Christianity. Maybe all the rules about Christianity, and there are, there are plenty of them, lots and lots of rules, maybe, maybe all those rules are instead instructions on how to love. Not reward and punishment, but teaching us how to love just for the sake of love. Maybe these laws and commandments, they're they're not about what happens to us when we obey them or when we disobey them. In fact, I don't think it's really about us at all. Maybe instead, it's all about others and how we can love them through the love of Christ. Friends, Christ has already won the reward for us. We don't have to worry about it anymore. We don't have to strive and, and, and do everything to try to earn what Christ has already accomplished. And Christ has saved us from the punishment. We don't have to worry about that. We couldn't have done it for ourselves anyway. He's done it for us. And because of that, we can put our own self-interest aside and just love. It's tremendous freedom. But we are. We are sinful by nature. We are self-centered by nature. We tend to strive for carrots and run away for sticks, from sticks, all for our own benefit. That's just how we operate. And we need help. We need help in learning how to really love. A lot of help. And so this, this Christian kingdom that is so unique in our world, in our experience, it's the only place it shows up. It's so unique that there is a steep, steep learning curve around living into it. And so the scriptures are full of advice about what to do and not to do. Not in order to, to earn a reward or to avoid a punishment, but to, to learn to live into this freedom of love. That's what the right and wrong is about. 
the seeds, the seeds of this are already planted. That's the beautiful thing about it. This, this non-reward and punishment system, this relational community that Christian is, it's here. It's real. It is available to us today, right now. And this is our hope because Jesus established this, this relational community that no human could ever design. There's no social order that we could come up with that would achieve what Jesus has for us. In God's time, this relational community, this freedom to love, will become the new heaven and the new earth. It will be the way we live. And the seeds are already planted and growing now, and we are part of it to the extent that we will follow Jesus and place our salvation in his hands. That will allow us to love in freedom. O come, O come, Emmanuel. Emmanuel, God with us. God is with us. Christ is with us. Christ is in us. Leading us deeper and deeper into the understanding of this freedom to love. This remarkable way of going through life. Our hope rests in the completion of this Emmanuel community. No earthly system of government, no society, no matter how well thought out, no matter how well followed, no matter how ideal, will ever be able to offer what God has already accomplished through Christ. It can't. You see, it just doesn't have the authority to do so. No human effort ever has. God is the only one who could accomplish this. God is the only one that has the authority and the power and the love to set us free. Amen. Please join me for the affirmation of faith, which comes from O Come, O Come, Emmanuel. O come, O King of nations, bind in one the hearts of all mankind. Bid all our sad divisions cease and be yourself our King of peace.
And Jesus said, I am the bread of life. Whoever comes to me will never be hungry. And whoever believes in me will never be thirsty. Blessed are those who hunger and thirst for righteousness, for they will be filled. The Lord be with you and also with you. Lift up your hearts and lift them to the Lord. Let us give thanks to the Lord our God. It is right to give our thanks and praise. It is truly right and our greatest joy to give you thanks and praise, O Lord our God, creator and ruler of the universe. You formed us in your image and breathed into us the breath of life. You set us in this world to love and serve you and to live in peace with all that you have made. When we turned from you, you did not turn from us. When we were captives in slavery, you delivered us to freedom and made covenant to be our sovereign God. When we were stubborn and stiff-necked, you spoke to us through prophets who looked for that day when justice shall triumph and peace shall reign over all the earth. Therefore, we praise you joining our voices with the celestial choirs and with all the faithful of every time and place who forever sing to the glory of your name. O come, O come, Emmanuel, and ransom captive Israel that mourns in lonely exile here until the Son of God appears. 
You are holy, O God of majesty. And blessed is Jesus Christ, your Son, our Lord. You sent him into this world to satisfy the longings of your people for a Savior, to bring freedom to the captives of sin, and to establish justice for the oppressed. He came among us as one of us, taking the lot of the poor, sharing human suffering. And we rejoice that in his death and rising again, you set before us the sure promise of new life, the certain hope of a heavenly home where we will sit at table with Christ our host. Remembering your gracious acts in Jesus Christ, we take from your creation this bread and this wine and joyfully celebrate his dying and rising as we await the day of his coming. With thanksgiving, we offer our very selves to you to be a living and holy sacrifice dedicated to your service. O come, O key of David, Come and open wide our heavenly home. Make safe for us the heavenward road. Bar the way to death's abode. Gracious God, pour out your Holy Spirit upon us and upon these your gifts of bread and wine, that the bread we break and the cup we bless may be the communion of the body and blood of Christ. By your Spirit, Make us one with Christ, that we may be one with all who share this feast, united in ministry in every place, as this bread is Christ's body for us. Send us out to be the body of Christ in the world. And now, with the confidence of the children of God, let us pray as our Lord Jesus Christ taught us. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our debts as we forgive our debtors. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, and the power, and the glory forever. Now the Lord Jesus, on the night of his arrest, took bread, and after giving thanks to his heavenly Father, he broke it, saying, This is my body, broken for you. Whenever you eat of this, do so in remembrance of me. Then in the same way he took the cup, saying, This cup is the new covenant sealed with my blood shed for the forgiveness of your sins. Whenever you drink of this, do so in remembrance of me. Friends, each time that we partake of this bread and drink of this cup, We do celebrate our risen Lord, His salvation through His death. And we will do so faithfully until that day when He Himself comes to preside at this table. Let us pray. Strengthen us, O God, in the power of Your Spirit to bring good news to the poor, And lift blind eyes to sight, to loose the chains that bind, and claim your blessing for all people. Keep us faithful in your service until Christ comes in final victory, when we shall feast with all your saints in the joy of your eternal realm. Through Christ, with Christ, in Christ, In the unity of the Holy Spirit, all glory and honor are yours, almighty God, now and forevermore. Amen.
Please sing with us as we lift our voices in praise. Hymn number 176, Lift Up Your Heads, O Mighty Gates. Receive now the benediction. O come, O bright and morning star, and bring us comfort from afar. Dispel the shadows of the night and turn our darkness into light. Amen. <laughs> 